Hey, good morning, everybody. Great to be here. I don't know that I could ask for a better setup than what Rich and Phil just talked about with SaaS. So today we're gonna talk about SaaS security and anatomy of a data breach. We're gonna go through uh, three real world data breaches and talk about what we saw, what happened, what went wrong, and hopefully learn some lessons. So why am I here? Why are you listening to me? I'm Brendan O'Connor. I'm the CEO and co-founder of AppOmni, the leader in SaaS security. But before that, I was a security practitioner for 20 years. I was the CISO at Salesforce. I was there for a total of 10 years, about half the time as CISO. I was CTO at ServiceNow. I have led security teams at two of the leading SaaS providers. I've been doing SaaS security full time since 2007. This is what I've chosen to do with my life. This is where I want to make an impact on the security community. So we're going to talk about three common SaaS security pitfalls. We're going to talk about third-party application risk. We're going to talk about a customer support portal and anonymous API access. Could not be more timely, given what's going on this morning. And then uh, multi-factor authentication attacks, which if you have been paying attention to the news, is happening everywhere. So 2022 has been the year of the SaaS breach. We have seen more SaaS breaches this year, I think, than the past few years combined. Um, we, we had Okta in the beginning, but we have seen Twilio. We have seen LastPass attacked. We have seen MailChimp and HubSpot. We have seen Salesforce Heroku. We have seen Travis CI and GitHub. We have seen multiple attacks and breaches, either within the cloud provider or attacking a customer SaaS application to get at the data inside. So we're going to talk about third-party apps. And kind of piggybacking on what Phil just discussed, SaaS is highly overlooked. And for people that are paying attention to SaaS, they're almost not, definitely not paying attention to the third-party apps that are connecting to SaaS. So I'm going to talk about this. But SaaS is the number one way that organizations consume cloud. It's actually as big uh, on a dollar-per-dollar dollar basis than infrastructure and platform as a service combined. So SaaS is the number one way that businesses consume cloud, and it presents a ton of risk and attack surface to the enterprise. So I'm going to challenge you to think of SaaS logically like an operating system. Don't think of it as a single-page web app. Maybe that's what it was 10 years ago. But when you think about the security domains and how we think about SaaS security and controls, think of it like an operating system. And third-party apps are just like a user downloading an app from the internet onto their hard drive and running that application within your environment. Well, that same paradigm presents itself in SaaS. You can either run locally, and many SaaS providers have a native runtime, or you can connect via API. So it's side-loading an application into that SaaS environment. We have done research, and we have worked with hundreds of customers, and what we have found is, on average, you have 42 third-party apps that are connected into one of your SaaS estates. This could be M365, it could be Salesforce, it could be Slack, it could be GitHub. But on average, you're going to have 42 apps that are connected into that. Of those apps, 22 on average haven't been used by users in the past six months. This could be a freemium app, it could be a free trial app, or it could be an admin that installed it for all users, but they're not using it. But you have this privileged application that can run as the context of all these users and access their data, and they're not even using it but it remains there and it's running. When you think about an app running on your hard drive, you may need to launch it, to cl uh, click it to launch it and execute it. In SaaS, these apps are just running. It's cloud to cloud communication. So even if you're not using it, that third party SaaS app could be extracting your data and storing it somewhere else in another cloud. If you're not looking, you don't know what the app is doing, but it's running all day, every day in that SaaS application in the context of your users we find on average 20 of those 42 were installed directly by end users with no oversight or permission from IT or security. So think about that. If you looked at your firewall and you saw 20 hosts on the public internet directly connected into your production database and you, no one knew who they were or what they were doing, your hair would be on fire. You've got an incident on your hands. But if you go look at SaaS, this is typical that you're gonna have apps that you had no idea were in your environment, that users self-authorized and connected via OAuth or using their own credentials, and it is in your production environment today, highly likely syncing data or doing something with your data. What are these apps? It, the risk isn't one. We looked at all of the top cloud providers and pulled the top 10 apps from their ecosystems. You can see right here, they're all different. 
different use cases for different major cloud providers. The most popular GitHub app is not the most popular Salesforce app, is not the most popular Microsoft app. So you have this list of all these applications in these ecosystems. They're all different, they all have different purposes, but they all connect in the same way. They connect via API or OAuth into your cloud environment and they run just like an operating system. So we're gonna talk very briefly about how SaaS authentication works because it helps us understand this risk vector. I'm gonna go through this pretty quick. We're at a CSA event, so I imagine everyone here knows how session cookies and session IDs work in a web app. So there's three primary ways that we can act. Standard username and password, I log in on success, I get a session token. There's also much more commonly login flows involving an identity provider. This could be Ping Identity, Okta, ADFS, you know, pick your cloud provider, but you have an SSO portal or an IDP. So when you connect to this IDP, there's two types of flows. There's what's called an IDP initiated flow. You strongly connect to your IDP and you click a link or a tile and it goes out and logs you in automatically into Salesforce, into ServiceNow, into Microsoft. But the end result of that transaction is your browser has a session ID. There's also what's called a service provider initiated flow. In an SP initiated flow, this is where you're prompted, you know, log in with Google, log in with Facebook. Or in your SaaS application, you may be programmed that if you hit a certain landing page, it's gonna redirect you and push you into your IDP for authentication. Whichever flow you use, the end result is authentication session ID. At that point, only the session ID is used. Think of this like going into a, a nightclub and you've got the doorman and you have strong authentication outside and then you get a wristband to go inside and purchase alcohol. Once you're inside that domain, you don't have to show your ID anymore. You've got your wristband. Well, that's your session token. So the IDP was involved in strong authentication to let us in the front door. But once we got in, it's not part of the equation anymore. It's just direct communication between my browser and the SaaS cloud. So now I'm gonna decide to install a third party app. I'm gonna go into my office productivity suite and my friends are telling me about this grammar plugin that helps you write better emails, it helps you write better documents, they all love it, and I can get a free trial. So I'm gonna go connect this grammar app into my office productivity app. And what's gonna happen is, it's going to request, Brendan wants to connect, and this office productivity app, the SaaS provider is gonna say, hey Brendan, grammar app is requesting to connect and here's the privileges that it's asking for. It wants to sync your contacts, it wants to read your inbox, it wants to be able to read your OneDrive or your G Drive to see your documents. And this is not multi-choice. This is a, a thumbs up, thumbs down on the part of the user. You can't line item veto the app's privileges. It has a manifest and it says this is what I need to connect and you can either approve it or disapprove it. Well, if I wanna put this in, I'm probably gonna click approve. So now I have granted an OAuth token to this app that is all or a subset of my privileges. And the IDP was not involved at all. I did not have to 2FA, there was no additional strong authentication. This is a direct transaction between the cloud provider and this you know, cloud grammar app. Not a single packet went across my network. This is cloud to cloud communication and it prompted the already authenticated user, which is me, do you wanna do this? And all I had to do is say yes or no. So now all of a sudden I have an app, third party on the public internet that I just connected to my office productivity suite and it can see my inbox and all of my documents. What could go wrong? So OAuth is the way that applications talk to each other and this is not a bug, it's a feature. Think of SaaS as an OS and think about persistence of applications, of how you install an application and run it over time. So in this example, when these applications connect, think about the mail app on your phone. If you had to re-authenticate every time it synced your email, you'd never use it. OAuth tokens in these connected apps oftentimes bypass IP restrictions by design. Can you imagine if the second your IP changes on your mobile provider, you just don't get your email anymore? This is not a bug, it's a feature. We have designed these applications to make them easy for users to use, easy to connect, always on, always active. That's part of the cloud. So these apps connect and they're running all the time. It's like going to a nightclub and getting a wristband and never, ever, ever going home. You don't ever have to re-authenticate because you never went outside and have to go through the doorman again. You have the wristband, that application now lives within that SaaS estate and it has a token that gives it access. It's authorized. So this is where it goes wrong. We have seen this with SolarWinds. We have seen this with other recent breaches where they are going after the OAuth tokens or the, uh, the authorization API keys for a third party app. 
when we saw Heroku dashboard and Travis CI get attacked. This is what they were after. These API keys or these OAuth tokens survive password resets by design. As I mentioned, they often survive uh, IP changes, so it can access from any IP into the cloud. So if you can go after one of these third-party providers, I'm not attacking Microsoft, I'm not attacking Google, I'm attacking two guys in a garage with their grammar app. And if I take that over, I can get all the OAuth tokens for every user of that system. You don't just get Brendan's tokens, you get everyone else's. This is a huge piece of attack surface. And now that attacker can use those OAuth tokens to get into the environment with API access, and if it's high enough privilege, like a, a CI tool like Travis CI, it's probably got a whole lot of read-write access to many things. This is way more impactful than popping a single user. If you can pop one of these third-party apps, you have tons of tokens and you have authorized access to many, many customer environments. And on average, security and IT teams have no visibility or very little visibility into what apps are even running in their environment. So I'm not gonna read the slides. We have these uh, online and we have them in the presentation material. So I've got some lessons learned here. But the, the key takeaway is if you think of SaaS as an OS and you think of the risk of users downloading apps, it's the exact same thing that we have with malware, ransomware, and users downloading uh, bad code and running it on their computers. We have a whole industry that protects our endpoints and thinks about that. And at the time we finally kind of got good at it, all the applications are moving off our endpoints and into the cloud. And now users don't care whether they're using a Chromebook or, or Mac or Windows. They want to connect to Salesforce. They want to connect to DocuSign. They want to connect to, to Twilio. They're using that SaaS application. That's where the attack surface has moved. Now, I'm going to talk about a customer support portal, and I'm going to disclaim this by saying I'm, I'm not talking about what's happening today with Optus. We actually submitted these slides weeks ago, but it could not be more timely given current events. This is not theoretical. We see and we respond to real-world issues of customers getting breached via misconfigured or overprivileged APIs. And I'm going to walk you through a very, very common example of how we see this with the customer support portal. So here we have a standard support portal. Um, this is for my mobile provider. I log in, I can self-register. All I need is an email address and a phone number, and I log in. And I can see my data plan, I can make changes, I can log support tickets, I can request a new phone. Very standard customer support functionality. Nothing magic going on here. The difference is it's back-ended by a SaaS application. This is a portal running on a SaaS cloud. So the privileges that allow this portal to operate are namespaced or segregated to certain areas of the SaaS cloud. So what we've done is we've configured this to only be our customer support and case management system. They can't see other areas of SaaS, so we've cordoned off one area, and that's what the portal serves. And we have two different privilege profiles. One for our internal users, because they need to be able to support all these customer requests, open tickets, close tickets. And then for the outside world, our customers, our end users, we've given them the ability to create new tickets, to update their tickets, um, you know, read and make changes. So two different privilege profiles for internal versus external. So what we have here looking at this app, you see this little widget here on the side. We're going to come back to this in a second. This is my recent cases. There's a little piece of JavaScript that preloads this for each user so you can see your most recent alerts and tickets and, and notifications from your provider. Does everyone here know what a confused deputy attack is? Confused deputy attack is a classic attack where you can trick a program to using its higher level privileges on your behalf to do things that it's authorized to do but it wasn't intended. The most common example of this is like going with a, a coat check ticket or an order ID and saying, hey, I'm here to pick up order number one, two, three. And it turns out if there's no authentication of that credential, you can ask for order number one, two, four, order number one, two, five, one, two, six, and the robot, if it has the privileges to do that, is gonna serve that up to you. We see this exact pattern in SaaS all the time. So let's go back to our support portal. If we look at the JavaScript on this page, we're going to see an API query, and that's how that widget's getting populated, and we can see that it's passing a parameter. This is an ID parameter, and it's sequential. What the attacker did in this case is they simply looked at the JavaScript and incremented the integer on the ID and just started requesting other people's data. You know, show me case number 123, 124, 125, 126, 127, and they found out for each request, they got the response. So we have a confused deputy attack here where every user 
that is running externally and connected to this portal shares the same privilege profile. So I may not be able to escalate internally or become a case agent, but because every user has the same privilege, I can request anyone else's data. Millions of records were exposed this way. But the attacker did something else clever. They took it a step further because they found another ID number that was in the JavaScript, and this was the portal user ID. This is how the application knew I was Brendan and not Sarah. So what the attacker did is they took that portal ID and they did the exact same attack. Can I request user data based on user ID and just increment the integer and see what comes out? And they were able to extract hundreds of thousands, millions of records by simply having a script that increments an integer and just ask that API for data, and it responds. So what the outside world should have seen, the team that built this was the customer support team. They're very proud of what they built. They built a, a cool thing for their customers and for their business, and when they looked at it, it didn't look like there was any data exposure. It looked like it was working as intended. But because we didn't have security look at it, because we didn't have people actually dig into how this thing was configured, we missed some very, very common attack scenarios. So when we responded to this issue, this is what we actually saw. We looked at the privilege profile of the users and we found hundreds of thousands, in some cases millions of records that any given user of the application could access. Every external user had the same privilege profile and the SaaS application would respond to any of them and it would serve back any data that that user was authorized to, to view because it wasn't using the end user's privilege. It was using that API's privilege level. The same attack presents itself anonymously, where you don't even need to be logged in. In this case, I'm using an authenticated portal because this is real world, but what we're seeing today and other previous attacks, these are truly unauthenticated APIs. You connect to it with no credentials, you ask the right questions, and it responds with the data. Nothing is going to hamstring your MFA strategy or your zero trust strategy like unauthenticated data exposure on the public internet. It doesn't matter what your perimeter security is, it doesn't matter what your password policies are, you're not gonna see it. The user's not even logging in. They're connected to the API and they're downloading the data. So some things did go right here in that they thought about multiple privilege levels, they tried to segment off the SaaS application, they didn't wanna expose everything to the world. But the security team was taken by surprise because they didn't even know this existed. When they looked at this SaaS application when it was first brought in years ago, it didn't have the portal functionality in it. The customer hadn't turned that on. Like Phil was just discussing in, a, in his previous talk, he said, people pay way more attention to IaaS clouds than SaaS, and when it comes to SaaS, they say, well, you know, we asked 20 security questions and they have a SOC 2, so they must be a trustworthy provider. No one would ever say that about Microsoft Windows. Well, we pen tested Microsoft and they have a SOC 2. That's my endpoint security strategy. That's an insane thing to say. But when it comes to SaaS, we somehow take that as security. We're gonna ask the cloud provider a few questions. We're gonna pen test their firewall. We're gonna make sure they have a SOC 2 and our work here is done. These SaaS applications are operating systems that are constantly updated with new features and functionality. And the people in the driver's seat are your business users. They're not malicious insiders, they don't have bad intentions, but they're making changes like putting your public customer database on the internet through a support portal. And they're shooting themselves in the foot with a cannon. Last, I'm gonna talk about multi-factor authentication attacks. We have seen a whole lot of these recently. This is uh, definitely in the news. Um, I'm gonna talk in generalities, but uh, you probably know some of the attacks that I'm talking about here. In this case, we're seeing attackers that are directly phishing SaaS and they are MFA or second factor aware. Um, as I mentioned, I led security teams at Salesforce and ServiceNow. We saw custom malware built for our login pages. There is custom malware and there are criminal gangs out there that have very sophisticated phishing pages, browser plugins, malware, or just standard SMS phishing, which we're seeing more and more people getting phished via their, their cell phones so it doesn't go through our MTAs and all of our email filtering. So what we have here is an MFA aware phishing page and this user is getting phished and the attacker is enticing them to, to log in. And what they're going to do, sometimes it's a true phishing page, sometimes they're injecting uh, via the browser uh, overwrite on the form action so it really does look like the same form. It's just instead of posting that request to you know, GitHub or Microsoft or Salesforce, it's sending it to attacker.com. And the attacker is able to then immediately use that code in authenticate and they present back to the user there was something wrong with your code. So as they get authenticated, they present back to the user something went wrong, and this is something we've all experienced. 
If you're using TOTP, maybe you didn't type in those six characters quick enough and the code changed. Or maybe you typed in the wrong number when you got that SMS message. If the user gets one failed prompt and then is given a second one and it's successful, highly unlikely they're gonna pick up the phone and call security. You know, hey, I had one thing go wrong and then I entered my password again and it worked. So this is not an attack that your humans are probably going to report because it doesn't seem suspicious to them and they ended up getting logged into their SaaS application anyway. Now, if you were looking at the SaaS cloud, you would actually see back-to-back -back successful authentication and then you would see one of those IP addresses change because it was the attacker's IP once they were authenticated. From the user's perspective, they don't know. But if you're looking at your network or you're looking at your IDP logs, you may not see this at all. You need to go look at the SaaS cloud, the, that OS in the sky, and say, what's actively connected? What did we just see from an authentication perspective? So in this case, we're seeing users that are actively phishing and silently logging in the user or quickly logging in the user afterwards once they have an authenticated connection. Now that they are in this SaaS environment, they don't need to touch your LAN. They are gonna move around within that SaaS application or potentially move from SaaS application to SaaS application. So we have all of this telemetry from our networks, from our endpoints, from our servers, and often from our IaaS environments. Very seldom do I see a security team that's actually pulling telemetry from all of their SaaS providers and pulling it back into to Splunk or Snowflake or whatever their, their SIMS solution is. So this is a huge piece of attack surface. We're not getting local authentication signal all the time. The signal is always happening in the SaaS cloud. And oftentimes, we're not pulling this telemetry. So what the attacker was able to do in this case is they fished a user to log them into an HR application. Once they were in the HR application, they updated their personal information. Now, you can update your, your name, you can change your address, you can add a mobile phone number, um, maybe you wanna change what bank account your paycheck goes to, or you just had a child and you wanna add them to your insurance. There's many reasons users wanna self-serve and update their HR records. What this attacker did was they updated the compromised user's HR record with their phone number. They didn't take away the legit user's mobile phone number, they just added a second cell phone. So now a number that the attacker controls got added to the HR system. Now, many internal uh, processes around di uh, directory services, Active Directory, feeds off of HR. In a lot of cases, HR is the uh, source of truth of who actually works here. Um, and in this particular case, what happened was there was a batch job that every day trued up the HR system with the directory service. So there was a daily batch job that looked at all the users, who's authorized, who's not authorized, what's everyone's information, and it did a sync to Active Directory, and it trued everything up. So if you are looking at your logs, there's nothing suspicious. You had one user update a phone number, not atypical, and then you had a batch job that runs every single day, truing up all of your employees, and it made a few changes. Everything here is typical so far. But what that user ended up doing is they used their compromised password, or the user's compromised password, and they started logging into all these different SaaS apps. And every time they got a 2FA prompt, they picked the new cell phone number. So they were now able to successfully authenticate themselves using a stolen credential that they got from a dump and a mobile phone that's under their control, and they logged into so many different SaaS clouds. And they were able to just download all the data. Now, if you are looking at your IDP or you're looking at your internal logs, you're not gonna see this. But if you see that there's a user logging in from a new IP address into a bunch of different SaaS clouds very quickly, and you also see that they're using a mobile phone number that was added 12 hours ago as their 2FA target, that's pretty darn suspicious. But if you're just looking at your IDP logs or what's happening on your network, you're not seeing any of this activity. What we're seeing with breaches in SaaS is it doesn't necessarily look like a classic kill chain in our internal environments. I like to, to say the classic kill chain of, you know, uh, establish a foothold, achieve persistence, escalate privileges, move laterally, reconnaissance, and then data exfil. It's kind of like a bank heist. You know, it's a planned job. It's a multi-step operation. When we see breaches in SaaS, it's a smash and grab. It's like throwing a brick through a jewelry store window. You smash it, you take the data, you leave. There's no additional steps. You throw a brick through the window, you take the jewels, you run down the street. By the time you get signal that something bad occurred, you don't have a chance to prevent it. So when we looked at our internal networks, we were trying to buy ourselves detection time and expel attackers from our environment before they could achieve their objectives. What we're finding in SaaS is 
where uh, the initial intrusion and the data exfiltration are often the same event, or they're happening near uh, concurrently. It's so easy via API and these uh, data loader tools to quickly export data from SaaS clouds. And again, it's not a bug, it's a feature. So we have seen this multiple times, and we have also seen sophisticated attackers going after organizations like LastPass and Twilio so that they can get these 2FA codes. Because we're seeing 2FA everywhere, but the attackers have adapted, they're actively working around it, and in many cases it's working because we don't have telemetry on what's actually happening inside these SaaS applications. We're looking at the ground when all of our data is moving up into the cloud. So a few takeaways and best practices, and then I'll quickly do some questions. So, I mean, you've heard it a couple times today, uh, but you need to embrace the SaaS shared responsibility model, and it's different than IaaS. In SaaS, the, the SaaS OS, your bedrock is HTTP. You can't get any lower than that. That is the base level layer. So the tools we use in public cloud to look at east-west movement, to pull NetFlow, to look at what's happening in the operating system, how much memory is being used, what privilege levels processes are running as, you don't get that in SaaS. SaaS, the abstraction layer keeps getting raised. So all you have is the API HTTP layer and the tools the cloud provider gives you. And every SaaS application is different, which means the shared responsibility model is a little bit different. What does the cloud provider do for you? And what capabilities do you have as a customer to do things for yourself? Second, like I said, SaaS is the number one way organizations consume cloud. SaaS is becoming the new OS of the business. And the vast majority of customers don't have anyone that is a SaaS security engineer or own SaaS security. Sometimes it falls into infra, sometimes it falls into cloud, sometimes it falls into identity governance, but we're seeing more and more the need for people that actually pay attention to SaaS because it represents one of the biggest pieces of attack surface in the enterprise. And as Phil mentioned earlier, these upgrades, things are changing underneath you all the time. If you do nothing, the SaaS provider is changing and adding new features. That's part of the subscription model. Um, also, you need to look at the limited scope of your network-based tools. Attackers are coming from the public cloud and they're talking to the public cloud. They're not going through your CASB, they're not going through your SSE, they're not you know, hacking into your network and then going out to the public internet. So all of our network tools and our perimeter-based tools are often ineffective here because they're not seeing the risky transactions of public internet APIs downloading the data or external people 2FAing themselves using stolen credentials. None of that is happening on your network. So your network tools aren't showing it. And it's not because the tools have failed you. It's because the data has moved. And then lastly, I'm going to talk about how do you uh, actually take steps to protect your SaaS. You need to think about SaaS as an operating system. And you need to think about it not as a perimeter. You can't build a wall around the cloud. Whether it's third-party apps, whether it's a portal, whether it's API communication, batch jobs, you have to let someone into SaaS. So these SaaS clouds are uh, designed to make it easy for these authorized applications to come in and connect, but that really blows the perimeter model completely out of the water. Our perimeter looks much more like a sieve with many different sized holes in it, and each one of those holes is there for a reason. But don't think that you have your cloud behind IP protection and that external people can't uh, access it, because via these API exposures, via third-party apps, via things like support portals, there is a gateway or a window onto the public internet for the outside world to get into your SaaS cloud. Um, the second one, gain visibility into who has access to your data. We have taken the internal model of, uh, hey, they're internal and everyone's in sales, so they should all kind of see the same sales data, so we're going to let all of our salespeople have the same privileges in Salesforce. Can't do that. You really need to start looking at identity as the perimeter and what does that identity have access to? What do they need access to? I talked about, on average, 20 of 42 apps haven't been touched in the past six months. This is a huge piece of attack surface that you could go turn off now and probably not impact anything. But you have these open channels into your production environment that don't need to be there. And then I also want to talk about guardrails. Oftentimes, it's not IT, and it's almost definitely not security that's configuring these SaaS tools. It's the line of business. The sales team runs Salesforce. The HR team runs Workday. Maybe IT runs ServiceNow and GitHub or Confluence. Um, everyone uses M365 or G Suite. You, know, you may use Teams, you may use Slack. You have different users throughout the enterprise and different constituencies that use these tools. But for the most part, the security team, they don't have expertise in these business tools. 
They're made for the line of business, not a security engineer. And so we need to put guardrails around our users because they have the keys, they're the driver, and we're not helping them stay compliant. We're not helping them do the right thing. We're not looking at our SaaS clouds and the changes that they're making. So we have a lack of visibility and we have a lack of guardrails where our users are causing us a huge amount of pain, not because they're bad people, but because we're not helping them or it's so easy to step out of bounds in SaaS and shoot yourself in the foot. And then lastly, you know, again, echoing what Phil said, echoing what Rich said, SaaS is not a project, it's a program. You need to be looking at SaaS all day, every day. Continuous monitoring. This is the OS of business. Users are living in these SaaS applications. They're doing things all the time. They're adding data, they're changing data, they're adding third-party apps, they're reconfiguring the system, they're building automation and business processes. This is by design. That SaaS application is changing underneath your feet all the time. If you are not looking at it continuously, you're gonna have a problem. 